Hi everyone. It's lovely to see you all today. Thank you so much for joining us for this important session. Um, my name is Shanine. Um, I'm the creative director for the City of Culture Trust. So the City of Culture Trust is the organization who are tasked with producing the UK City of Culture in 2021. But of course, working very closely with artists from across Coventry and the cultural sector and communities in the city also. Just a little bit about me. Um, so I'm half Scottish and half Pakistani. Uh, I was born in Reading about 50 years ago. In fact, I turned 50 this year. Um, and so during the winter, um, I'm kind of a pale white color with rosy cheeks. Um, but in the, in the summer, my Pakistani jeans come out and I go a nice healthy brown glow um, with lots of freckles. Um, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of a thought about what I might look like for those who can't see me today. Um, I'm very young at heart um, and also I passionately believe in inclusion, uh, which is why we're all here today. I just wanted to say a few words um, just personally about me. My mum was, um, she lived with rheumatoid arthritis for about 30 years of her life. So I have some really close experience of uh, living with someone um, who faced many barriers, um, and not just in terms of her ability to um, live her life and the way she wanted to live it but also in terms of attitudes people had towards her so um, I've made that part of my commitment through my working life but also in my personal life to make sure we we think about those barriers um, a, a, across the board and try to remove them and change attitudes with people. I worked at the Arts Council for a number of years uh, between 2008 to 2011 um, and one of the pieces of work that I commissioned at that point was with Attitude is Everything who many of you may know um, they're an organization national organization based in London who, who mainly work or have worked across the music sector with musicians and music festivals really trying to change the way in which everyone can participate uh, in festivals. And I worked very closely with them at the Arts Council to really think about outdoor festivals more generally uh, in the UK um, and to think about how, how producers, commissioners, uh, stage managers, uh, marketing people can change their attitudes and their understanding of what barriers exist for people and how we might remove them or change them. Um, also, when I was working as creative programmer for the Mayor of London, I worked with Attitude is Everything again, um, as well as with Shape and with Unlimited to really think about how we created a program with our creative communities across London that was inclusive, um, and celebrated the breadth of talent um, that we had on offer. So I'm bringing all of this with me to this role for Coventry. I want us to be a shining beacon of inclusion. Um, and one of the pieces of work that we've been developing um, is a real um, strategy uh, around access and inclusion. Um, and so really great to be with all of you today so that we can really get that journey going um, in partnership with you all. I also just wanted to say that I've worked with Jo probably over about 10 years through her work at Unlimited um, and been part of many of the panels um, uh, that she's led in, in uh, commissioning and selecting um, deaf and disabled artists uh, for, for, for wider investment across the cultural sector. Um, and I know today that we are going to reveal some new opportunities um, that we're going to share with you. So I hope that you'll stay with us so that you can um, hear about those great opportunities that are on their way. 
Um, just very quickly um, about City of Culture, for those that don't know. City of Culture, um, it's, uh, the, we're the number three, we're the third UK City of Culture. The first one was in Derry, Londonderry back in 2013 and was really developed in response to the great success that Liverpool experienced as being the European City of Culture in 2008. And we follow Hull, who had their City of Culture in 2017. Um, I think in terms of our approach to our City of Culture and our vision, we absolutely want to embrace and test and understand what we mean by cultural democracy. So really understanding how programs on this scale can be developed with artists, with communities, um, and also thinking a lot about co-creation. So how we create programs as a partnership between communities and artists. Uh, we're also working very closely um, as well as with local artists in the city and region um, and the cultural sector. We're also working with um, community organizations who are helping us really to reach into our communities so that we really consider inclusion as a kind of 360 degree approach. Um, some of the organizations we work with are very committed to really exploring and taking action around human rights, um, but also tackling loneliness, um, some of the issue, issues that people experience around isolation, um, as well as tackling exploitation of, of people in the city, particularly younger people, um, and opening our hearts and minds to new communities that arrive in our city and making sure that we're a city of cultures rather than just one culture. Um, I think we all understand that um, cities have many cultures and we want to embrace all of those. I think it's also important to say that we, whilst we want to have a great celebration of Coventry and um, all of its people and all of its cultures, we also want to face up to some of the tougher stuff, some of the difficult issues um, that we face in our city and that many cities are, are facing. So not necessarily different to us, um, but really trying to um, create better understanding of each other um, and try and make as much difference as we can. We did, we did say right at the beginning that we would be driven by the outcomes that we wanted to see, um, to see the change happen in our city and that we would work hard to be driven by those rather than to create a program and hope that change happens. To be very focused on change for the city and for our people. Um, so that's, that's really part of our vision, to really create a program that has action at its heart. I think the other thing I wanted to mention is that whilst it's important that we root our programme in the heritage and the history of the city. We want our programme to be future facing. So looking forwards and, and understanding the future that we want for ourselves, our children and the next generation. So really important that we think forwards um, and, and, and try and imagine what that world could and should look like. Um, just in terms of some of our themes, we have developed a manifesto um, and we do have a storyboard um, which sets out a number of monthly themes that we hope to capture within our wider campaign. And I'm sure that those can be shared with you um, as we move forward. I'm not going to run through all of those today. Um, what I would say, though, is that we are the UK's only city of peace and reconciliation. And that really, that, that understanding of peace and reconciliation, that understanding of friendship, of internationalism, of inclusion, um, and of really connecting our program, not just across our city, but also nationally and internationally is really vital for us. So really hope that you can 
join us in um, trying to make some of that vision happen. Um, I would just finally say that I'm really delighted that the, the panel that are here today, um, that, that Ellen and, and Joe and the team have been, that been able to bring together such a great group of people. And thank you so much for working with us um, to make sure that we can really create something extraordinary for 2021 and beyond, because this isn't just about our year of culture. It's about changing the way in which we all think, behave, uh, understanding greater uh, depths uh, to all of ourselves and each other, um, and really making that change happen in our city. So I hope that you'll be able to join us um, to try to make that happen and that it has a wider impact across the country. I'm gonna stop talking now and hand over to Joe, who I know is gonna chair today's workshop. But again, thank you all so much for joining us. Have a great afternoon. I look forward to um, uh, seeing and hearing more of the work that you're all gonna be doing with us in, in coming months and years. Um, and I shall catch up with you all again. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. Okay, my name's Jo Berent. I'm Senior Producer at Unlimited. I'm a 50-something white woman with um, grey slash dyed hair tending towards the plump, uh, is always the best audio description of me I can give. More tending towards, especially as lockdown continues. Thank you all very much for joining us uh, here today. We've got a great panel uh, in front of us. This is a strange event. This is the 10th Unlimited Connects event. Um, usually we're in a room sharing uh, artists and allies, sharing opinions and uh, perspectives. But now we're on Zoom doing that. We've asked people to turn their videos off for this bit, simply so you can watch the panel as a whole uh, on gallery view if you want to, rather than uh, just speaker view. We know that's easier for some people. We will get to see everybody later on when we do the breakout groups, so don't worry about that. And please bear with us. Um, we're learning, as same as everybody else. This is our first Connects event uh, that we've done online. So if we do make mistakes, please, uh, yeah, be gentle. Be gentle with us. So I'm going to get the panel, which I'm really excited about. I'm going to get the panel to introduce um, themselves. We're just going to do an interpreter swap over. Uh, Kyra is just going to swap over for Victoria, so we'll just pause while that happens. Brilliant. Okay, so I'm going to get the panel to introduce themselves. Our topic today is new futures. What must we take forward? We're asking how can we ensure that the new future cultural sector is more equal, more accessible, and more inclusive than the one before lockdown. So, Rinku, tell us who you are. Okay, all right, I hope everyone can see me. Yeah, Rachel's going to speak for me. Sorry, I'm a little bit lost because I'm looking for the interpreters and amongst the whole kind of panel on Zoom. So could you repeat the question, please, Jo? Yes, just introduce yourself to us, Rinku. Okay, so thanks, thanks, thanks for repeating the question. So my name is Rinku and I'm a theatre maker, previously a stand-up comedian, and I've directed and performed a one-man show called Made in India with the word India slashed out, uh, crossed out and said next to Britain. And um, I was directed by Daniel Bailey creating that show and that was in the, in the foundry course with Birmingham Rep. So I directed, created and directed that show. And also now I'm doing a research and development project called Chocolate. And I'm also doing a research and development project called Bubble and Butch, which was initially funded by Unlimited. So I'm a theatre maker, do lots of different things as well, but I'm not gonna waffle on because I don't want to bore you, sorry. So I think I'll just keep it short and sweet for now. So I'm a theatre maker. Fantastic. Jo, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Jo Bannon. Um, I, for those of you who can't see me, I have white blonde hair. Um, 
tied up in a bun, but I've started trying to learn how to cut my own fringe. So um, I've got a wonky fringe. Um, and I'm an artist. Uh, I work in performance and choreography mainly. Um, and I've been lucky enough to receive two awards from Unlimited um, to make uh, one one-to-one -one performance called Exposure um, and a second group dance piece called The Earth Art. Um, and I live in Bristol now, but I am a cob girl. Fantastic, thank you. Joey, can you introduce yourself, please? Uh, hello, I'm, I'm Joey. Uh, I wear glasses and I've got shorter hair than I normally have. I think we call it COVID cuts at the moment. Um, and I am an activist. Uh, so I do uh, lots of work with Grapevine to get people's voices heard that might normally be overlooked or ignored and my my biggest passion is to make sure that nobody is ever underestimated fantastic thank you uh becky can you introduce yourself please certainly um i'm becky morris i'm the director of the disability collaborative network known as dcn in heritage and we support organizations of all sizes in respect to inclusive practice in the service provision working practice and workforce and i'm also an associate consultant of embed which is a cross-sector consortium in regards to inclusive practice um, i wear glasses i have got shortish hair which is starting to outgrow its layers because of co because of the lockdown and I'm wearing a pink top and I'm about 46. That's very specific that's not about. <laughs> <laughs> can you introduce yourself please? Hi everyone I'm Amit Sharma uh, I'm the deputy artistic director of the Birmingham Rep uh, we make theatre theatre in our building we have three spaces uh, and theatre outside of our building across uh, the city of Birmingham and the West Midlands um, I'm a brown disabled man um, I walk with a limp uh, but I'm currently sitting at the moment um, I have pretty wild hair at the moment um, a bit Dickie Davis which basically means that it's um, a bit white at the front and a bit dark at the back uh, in a quiff-like manner. It's really, really great to, uh, to be part of the panel today. Excellent. Thank you all very much. That's our panel today. And I asked them to do a bit of you know, work in advance, preparation for today. I asked them to come up with what if they only had to take one thing forward, one thing that would make things better after lockdown in terms of the cultural sector what would that be so we're going to find out what everybody said and uh, we've got a chance to dig a little bit deeper as a panel and then once we've got through everybody's one thing we'll open it up for questions uh, from you lot out there too so i'm going to go to becky first of all and she said collaboration so tell us more about that becky well for me one of the key elements of this terrible time is that we've had to learn things very quickly. And the key thing is with that is that from the moment we locked down and our museums and our cultural organisations closed, we had to learn how to work from home. And we also had to learn about digital technology. But working from home has actually, if we take that on board, could support so many people within our working practice and the representation of our workforce because we've understood what needs to be done and also what needs to be implemented to make that happen. But most importantly, we know that it has to happen and that we can do it. Another thing in terms of collaboration as well is about the amplification of, of, voices, of, of voices. As we look at our needs in respect to inclusion, our needs change as people. But we've also got to think about who we have around the table and who isn't there. What does that mean in terms of our services? What does that mean in re representation of our workforces and our work in practice? And the only way we can actually resolve this is through collaboration. This is why DCN is called the Collaborative Network, because from the offset, we always said that we would look and find answers through talking to people and through understanding that my barrier is not somebody else's barrier, that my non-barrier is somebody else's barrier 
and how fundamentally we can create more inclusive experiences by being intersectional, by ensuring that the right people are around the table in terms of conversations, but also implementing this as a process of action and making it that it's at the core of everything that we do. And reflecting that when it comes to inclusion itself, that it's on multiple layers, where it be the digital communications through to our public messaging, through to our marketing, through to our work in practice, through to the objects that we have on display, and also in terms of how that interpretation is there. But the key thing is as well, is that we've got to see what the audiences think and what the community thinks in terms of what museums are. Because often we're very good at self-reflecting what we think is good, when actually we need to go out there and talk to people, particularly where I live, which is an, an amazing town. It has an, an incredible history. I'm from Northampton originally, and Northampton's very famous for its boot and shoe, but Nuneaton is famous for so many different things. But the key thing is, is that ensuring that that history itself is represented and also that those messages in terms of social and economic impacts, in terms of value, and also in terms of mental health are there as well. So I'm that's what collaboration is for me. Ask you a question, Becky. So during lockdown, what thing have you personally learned about collaboration? What new collaboration have you started as a result of being in this ridiculously awful, horrendous situation? Well, it's, it's well, as a person, I'm on a, on a list. I'm, I'm moderate risk. Um, I'm, as I say, I'm 46 and I'm type one diabetic. Um, so as you know, as the reports go, that's not a good thing as with a lot of people who are at risk of this in terms of the virus. For me personally, we've joined up with Embed, which is a cross sector consortium. And the idea is, is that for me, my key learning from this experience is that things have to change. And they're going to change and they will change and they've got to change it's non-negotiable because what we know from across sectors is is that the more flexible an organization is in knowing its staff in knowing its practice and knowing what it needs to do the more likely it is to be able to negotiate around these hairpin difficulties that we have right now to be able to get somewhere and you can only do that by collaborating with other people. So that's why we're talking to Embed and working with Embed to produce resources. Excellent, so a real practical example of somebody who actually has made new alliances, yeah. put new people together yeah. as a result of this. Uh, like Becky, I'm, I'm on one of the lists, I'm on the shielding list, and I don't want to miss out on a cultural <laughs> in the future. I want to be part of what's going on, even if I can't leave yeah. this room. It is yeah. That is um, and inclusion can be fun it's like um the, the captions that stage texts do on um on the friday night theater events like that and everybody's singing singing along but you need to have the captions there in order to sing along so inclusion is all of us but it also can be fun okay so collaboration we have amit what's your one thing that you really want us to take forward for me, it's about community, community work and being at the heart of everything we do. When I was thinking about um, the, the challenge you set forward, Joe, um, I, I meditated on community a lot. And <clears throat> for me, when I, was, when I was younger, my first kind of stage performance, the, the first time I actually got on a stage, which is outside of my school, was a community performance of a play called Indian Summer written by Hawant Baines, Hawant spelt H-A-R-W-A-N-T, Baines. And you know, for me, that kick-started my role within the arts because um, I didn't quite make it as a successful actor. I made it as an actor, um, but I started from, from, the, from the community and I got opportunities within different communities, whether it was the deaf, deaf and disabled artistic community, whether it was the British Asian artistic community, or whether it was just the artistic community. Community kind of felt very, very important and it felt at the center of, of uh, opportunity. Um, and as a director, I've also worked within a community in a non-professional setting. And I've seen how important and how much joy 
and how much collaboration, actually, the word that Becky used, um, community can kind of bring. And it feels like right now, with all of us being isolated to one degree or another, that when we come out, we have to embrace community. We have to come together and we have to show what we're, what we're brilliant at. So that, that's, that's why I say community. Can I ask, and this is a very personal question, so you can, can ignore me and choose not to answer, but are you part of the community or are you part of many people? And if, if many, I think which is most important? I can't answer which one is more important. I think they all are. But what I can say is, I think perhaps we're probably living in a moment where specificity is really important now. You know, um, BA, that's not specific. I mean, talking about I think we've lost your audio for a minute. For me, when we use that term, we talk about it in numbers. But right now, community is about people. Community is about the lived experience. Many communities, but they... Okay, we've, we've lost Amit. He's, he's disappeared, he's back. We'll ask him a bit more about that later, but we're going to give him a chance to sort his, uh, his audio out if there's a way of doing that. I'm going to go to Joe Bannon uh, next. So, uh, Joe, what's your one thing that you really want us to take forward? Um, well, I haven't got a pithy one word for it, but uh, I've been thinking a lot in this time about permission and who gives you permission to do what. and um, so my proposal is, I've been thinking a lot about how our organisations are structured and whether they really serve us. And I guess I speak here as an artist and I am interested in kind of toppling the power. So I see most cultural organisations set in a kind of pyramid structure with an artistic director or a CEO at the top. And then at the very bottom are the freelancers who are often the artists who are providing the art, which is the central uh, function of those buildings or those organisations. So I think this might give us an opportunity to look at if we're really happy with that structure. And I think there might be great resourcefulness and kind of tenacity. I, gu I guarantee you the people who will survive will be the artists. So what if those artists are actually given salaried positions in organisations and the freelancers are people that the artists choose to employ to deliver marketing or comms or front of house? Is it a given that we have to continue in the way that we've always worked? Um, and I was reading this uh, quote from Frank O'Hara, the American poet, which is really stuck with me. Um, and he said, in times of crisis, we must all decide again and again who we love. And I think my experience of this time has been continually assessing what's important, who I love, who I'm protecting. Um, and I think we could look at that in terms of how we function as an industry. Who do we love? Okay, I'm just going to pause there while we swap over from Victoria to Kyra again. which gives us a real opportunity to, to think about who we love in that break. I'm just thinking about that idea of rebalancing. How easy do you think it would be to let, well, for those at the top of the pyramid that you describe, how easy is it gonna be for them to let go of the positions that they have, the power and the control that they have, however much they might love artists, do you think that's going to be an easy transition to make? Well, I think it's going to be really hard. Um, yeah, I, I guess um, I'm living in Bristol now. So um, we have an empty plinth right now that used to be occupied by Colston. 
and it was unimaginable that he could be removed. Now there is this gap on that place where something else can go. And I think it takes a lot of negotiation to topple those structures. And sometimes, um, yeah, sometimes very direct action. Um, so I doubt it's going to be easy, but I think, and I say this with real respect, organisations are structured the way they are because, well, who knows how that came about, but I'm sure that every individual in those organisations has artists and art at their kind of core. But we have this moment of pause, so what could we do with that? It's a chance to actually make change happen. Okay, I'm going to come to Joey. What do you think we should take forward? What should we be doing in this moment of pause? Well, um, something I've always said way before lockdown is about listening. And I don't mean in the physical sense. When I say listening, I mean really listening to people um, because it's easy to just um, hear somebody but uh, listening to someone is a completely different thing. Um, my, my, since a very young age, my verbal communication used to be very limited, uh, which has meant that now my thing that really, the thing that drives me is making sure that everybody is heard. Um, I, I absolutely love working with people who are nonverbal or have communication challenges because I think it's so important for somebody to sit and listen to them and sit and show them that they, they, they have as much of an opportunity to share and they are just as important as everyone else in the world. And we should respect that and we should listen to them no matter how that looks like, whether that's sitting next to someone and not saying a word or observing how somebody is viewing the world, but making sure they get an, an equal chance because that's what accessibility is. It's not about uh, revamping buildings, getting somebody physically through a door. It's about making sure that there's a, a, levy, a, a level playing field so that they've got a meaningful voice within their community. Um, and I think during lockdown, that has really forced us into having to not just listen, but really hear people. Um, a lot of people now, when they're asking if somebody is okay, uh, they, they, they really mean it. They want to hear the answer. Whereas before, that's just something people just say. And they might, might listen to your answer, but do they, do they hear the answer is a different, a different story. So you think that the, the situation in lockdown has meant that more voices are being heard? Yes, I think it has forced us into that. Uh, it's forced us into thanking the people that we often underestimate, the key workers that mm -hmm. are often underestimated. I think it's difficult because I, as a wheelchair user, people will see the wheelchair, not me, but I'm an NHS worker. So it's a very strange experience because when we were having our Thursday clap for carers, I'm going out the house and I'm wondering, are you really clapping for me? You know, I have worked throughout the entire of uh, lockdown because of the um, because my job is is uh, of a high responsibility, and I've had times in the past where I've gone through the hospital and I've been stopped by security staff or porters and said, "Do you do realise that this is a staff only corridor?" Because they've seen a wheelchair and they've straight away assumed that how could a disabled person be working here? Yes, absolutely. I think that that rebalancing in the way that people can see us. Many people have told me that um, for many disabled people, when you just see this part of somebody, a lot of our uh, impairments become more invisible than they ever were. I've certainly felt, even though I'm on the shielding list, I felt better because I'm not knackering myself with traveling. I used to travel a lot before lockdown. Um, so health-wise, I'm actually better, even though I'm apparently more vulnerable. It's a strange, um, yeah, strange mix of different things that are that are happening at the same time. But I'm going to come on to Rinku's um, 
last point. We were talking about this just before everybody came in and I was asking what his, his kind of one thing is. And you said something really interesting about, about self-reflection, about that this is a time when we have an opportunity to really look inside ourselves to find what's important. So tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, yeah, yes, I'm voicing for you, Rinku. Yeah, Rinku's just pinning Rachel, who's gonna speak. Yeah. Okay, so hi everyone. So absolutely, it's been very strange actually, when, well really, compared to before lockdown, prior to lockdown, I felt like, you know, I was in the normal world, going along, and then lockdown happened, and everyone had to stay at home. Everything kind of stopped. And I was trying not to kind of change, actually. I was trying to be the same Rinku as I was before lockdown. You know, the old Rinku would go to the gym, I'd like to have eat some healthy food, I'd like to watch telly. But now, now during lockdown, the first month was fine. Second month, I started to notice the change in my behavior. I noticed that I started to, I don't mean nasty, become nasty, but I started to moan a bit. And I was kind of like, no, I'm not the kind of person that whinges all the time and moans. And I realized lockdown has actually changed me a lot. And after two months, I couldn't stay in home at all because I realized that actually I miss deaf people in the deaf community and deaf people, you know, they're, you know, they're kind of like the original indigenous people. So my indigenous people. So part of my identity is linked to sign language, deaf culture and the deaf community. And I can't see my friends. I had to stay at home. I live with hearing family. So that was a part of my, I, my identity that I sort of had to deny myself for two months. And I decided, you know, actually I need to lock the door to my office. I don't want to see hearing people anymore. Um, you know, I don't want to see people who don't know sign language. I've noticed my behaviours changed and I realised that I really missed, you know, my normal kind of life and my normal lifestyle. I miss, I miss my deaf community. So I've decided that I've got to change. I've got to change my behaviour. I've got to start looking after the world. I've got to, you know, beg almost, beg the world, whoever's in charge, who's ever, who's running this world. I've got to make an apology and say, I promise I will clear up, I'll clear up in terms of my, my, my environment and my use of resources. So it's a bit strange yesterday or a couple of days ago, I went out for a walk and one man threw some rubbish on the street and I got really cross and I shouted at him. I said, oi, pick that up. And I said, come on, pick it up. And the man was like, whoa. But I said, come on, clear that up. And I realized that I kind of, I missed how I, I miss how I used to be. But funnily enough, you know, unfortunately, I've, I actually actually experienced COVID-19. Um, I had it, unfortunately. Um, and I realized it was very, very difficult to manage throughout that illness. And uh, it took three weeks to recover, three to four weeks to recover from COVID-19. And uh, I haven't seen my friends, I haven't seen anyone really, until I went to the, sh the shopping centre. I went to Costco um, shopping centre and I bumped into a deaf person in Costco. And I realised, oh, I have missed my language. And I realised, actually, it's quite scary to go out. And also the person the deaf person told me um, that they'd noticed that a lot of deaf people have, had actually started to um, develop mental health issues and go downhill because they don't know what's going on. They've not got access to communication. Deaf people struggle to read English. They don't really understand what's going on. The government um, announcements and press releases don't have an interpreter in vision. So deaf community are starting to panic actually they don't really know what's going on they don't know what they're allowed to do or what they're not allowed to do they're not really sure of the rules under lockdown so it's quite a sad situation for the deaf community so that's had a real um impact on the mental health of the deaf community i think it's really so oh. and I, oh. I was going to say i think it's really interesting that so much of what you found out about yourself during this time 
links to what Amit was saying about community and about who our communities are and how important they are to us, sometimes more than we, more than we thought beforehand. Um, it's really interesting, the groups, I found it really interesting, the groups that I've joined online, the support networks that I've joined are different during lockdown than they were before. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that changes kind of afterwards. So I wanna ask all of us really, how do we make some of these things become real? How do we make, oh, we're gonna do a quick interpreter swap over. Okay, um, yeah, how do we make some of these things real? How do we make sure that collaboration and community and really listening and that sense of, of strength in our own identity and, and Joe's changing the power balance, how do we make sure that those things become real in, in life after lockdown, which, is, which has started today, the rules have already started to change. How do we make sure those things are central to that change? Who wants to come in? Oh, it's a quiet panel now. Who's gonna speak first? I'm gonna to come to Joe. How do we make these things real? Um, well, I think, yeah, there's, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, I think the most immediate thing that comes to my mind, it's not necessarily how to do it, but it's certainly how to find out where we are, is I think about transparency and finding out where the value is being placed in organizations. So where is the money? Where, what is being spent on what? What proportion of any organization's uh, expenditure goes on their program, goes on the art, goes on the artists? Um, in the same, like, there's very practical things like ending zero hours contracts. I think there's quite a lot of parallels between freelancers and zero hours key workers. Um, yeah, in order to find out what needs to be changed, I think we need transparency about what has been the systems we've followed up until now without, without recrimination, but with a kind of new yeah a new perspective on where we want to put our energy now where do we want to put value now okay so it's a really practical thing that we can do is to be more transparent about what we do how we operate um and making our values really clear through what we do what else can we do to make sure these things come amit we lost you so maybe we can uh, bring you in now hopefully without you sounding like um a I, I practiced that Dalek voice for so long. Um, How do we make it real? Practically what we can do. I, th I, think, I think, you know what, it, it, it comes down to imagination. You know, that, I think that's what powers everything. And um, there's, there's an opportunity, I think, with... It, we, we, we would all want to hold some form of power because it, it holds our destiny. Um, and we don't live in that kind of structure at the moment, but there's a, there's a moment right now where we can ask questions of the people, inverted commas, that we feel have agency. So we could head towards that phrase that was used earlier, a cultural democracy. And perhaps the apathy we had as activists before, I love Joey going, I'm an activist. You know, the activism that we had before, the slight apathy towards it, actually it's as, as the world is showing us right now, is it's now is the moment to kind of ask those questions of, of ourselves to kind of go, this is what we want to change. This is what we need to change. So if we, if we aim for the stars, we'll at least get to the moon. I'm really interested that nobody's single thing was just about access. Nobody went access, it's got to be that. Access is part of what everybody said, but nobody, these things are not disability specific. Community, collaboration, 
changing power balances. None of those are disability specific. And I wonder, Joey or, or, or Becky particularly, um, why do you think that is? Why do you think we're not just focusing on the disabled experience, the very specific things that just, that, that we need? Oh, Becky first. Yeah, so for me, it's about the idea that, and, and it's a reality that our needs change at any given time. And as we get older, it can be things like losing your glasses, to having he uh, hearing difficulties, to um, non-diagnosed neurodiversity, to um, having a broken leg. All of these create barriers to people. If somebody changes the budget towards public transport, which means that you can't get from the north to the south, that immediately creates a barrier for people and also it influences who can come through your front door. So for me, it's about how you develop through with inclusion in terms of that accessibility, but what influences that as well. So I was also going to say, what are the challenges and the influences? And this can be within the organisation as well as outside it. So when it comes to anything in relation to educational um, difficulties. So at the moment we're experiencing cuts towards SEND. Um, so the SEND code of practice, which means that there are people um, who are not getting what they need to in order to be the best they can be within the workplace. So what does that mean in terms of our current working practices as a heritage and cultural sector? And how will that influence who we have as our workforce in the future? So instead of asking people to change for us, we need to see how we need to change for other people. But you can't do that unless you talk to them. So that's where I'm sort of coming from in that respect to that. Yeah, I'm all up for other people changing as well. I've done Oh, yes. <laughs> Five other people wanted to, uh, need to do a little bit of changing too. Um, Joey, I just wanted to, to, to ask you if, Somebody said earlier, and I don't know whether it was a question or, or a comment, but they're saying, how do we get people to work with not just the usual suspects? So if it's theatre groups, how do we get them to engage with people outside of the groups that they already know? And that seemed to link into your point about listening to me. How do we go beyond the, the kind of people that we already know in order to make some of these things actually happen? I think if we could take something from lockdown, I would really hope that we could use it as a learning opportunity. My massive concern is, is that in the end, this could easily be forgotten. All of the lived experience could be forgotten so quickly once society goes back to normal. Um, and in some senses, lockdown has been awful. Uh, I, I struggle a lot with autism and I rely very much on mental health support. And I can't access that support physically. I rely on very small things like the touch of someone's hand. When I feel frightened, that's the one thing I want to do is touch someone's hand. And I can't do that. And I, I went into a bit of a meltdown at work the other day. And it's never happened to me. It's never happened to me before. And I reached out to touch someone's hand. And then I realized and I thought I felt so isolated for that one moment. But at the same time, lockdown has meant that the group I work with with Grapevine, the Coventry Youth Activists, seems to have brought us so, so close because a lot of disabled people as well, we live far away from each other and it's not, not easy to get back and forth. Um, so having the uh, ability to video call has meant that we've gone from meeting once every two weeks to three times a week now and it's it's really given people that opportunity because we have a mixture of abilities and one of my absolute closest friends he relies on Makaton so he'll talk to me and then I'll translate to the group and now we have members of the group who can now pick up his specific communication that's independent to him so he doesn't feel so isolated now because we've had to have such intense one-to-one -one the whole time that people 
kind of understand his communication now for the first time I feel like he feels like his opinions genuinely matter and that for the first time somebody can actually do something from what he says and that somebody's going to listen to him so it's about how do we hold on to that post lockdown I wanted to ask Rinku how do we how do we hold on to that reflection that you've been doing and that newfound kind of sense of what's really important. How are you going to make sure you hold on to that after COVID-19 has passed? Yeah, that's a difficult question, actually. That's hard to answer. I think, sorry, hang on one minute, just putting the interpreter. I can't see Rachel, where is she? I can't see either of them. Yeah, I've got, I've got her. I've got her. Okay. So, so I feel, well, I've learned a lot during lockdown and I, I feel the value of humanity and that human identity. And I think humanity is a priority. People have had more time for self love reflection to look back at their lives to think about improvements they could make how they can work with other people how we can live together better and i just think that is a big issue and a big impact so you know when you want to you know i used to pay to go on holiday and that would be my switch off process my flight and that's how i would do it but now now things are different we're in lockdown we have to stay at home and i've spent more time thinking about other people and how they're suffering every day under lockdown. And I've learned a lot from other people around me and especially right now with Black Lives Matters movement. So I feel, I think it's about the value of our humanity. And I really appreciate my learnings about humans and human identity. Okay, so we're getting to the end of the panel now. Um, I want to ask everybody for one word. Are people feeling hopeful? Are people feeling uh, nervous? What do we think? If you had to sum it up in one word, what will the change be? Will there be any change at all? I might have to allow slightly more than one word. There's a lot of things in there. But I'm really interested in, yeah, summarise how you feel the cultural sector might be after lockdown i'm going to come to becky first right okay um the sector has to change it's non-negotiable it has to change if it wants to survive it has to change and the key thing is with that is about working together to see what we can do to amplify our voices to make sure that we get money to keep ourselves in an approach that is inclusive that's representational but also in terms of being reflective and pragmatic of the difficulties that we find ourselves in. But it has to change. Okay, so the one word would be, ha well, a couple of words, has to change. Things have to change. No excuses anymore. Amit. I agree with Becky. Um, I just would add that it's going to be painful. That is the word for me. It's, it's going to be painful because there are so many unknowns. We're all at different journeys uh, in coming out of lockdown. It was really interesting when lockdown sort of happened. Everyone, if you follow the social model of disability, became disabled, you know, and the state for a lot of us, not all, but a lot of us came to the rescue, which isn't the disability experience. And lo and behold, as we're coming out of lockdown, the state's coming again for a lot of non-disabled people and dis disabled people are still being left behind. So I kind of feel to our non-disabled friends listening, remember that experience in March when you couldn't go out and what that felt like and, you know, help and support and be allies in, in making sure that deaf and disabled artists uh, don't get left behind. So I, I'm, I'm an optimistic Painfulist. <laughs> okay, it's going to be painful, but you're optimistic that it can happen. Jerry, what about you? Sorry, Joe, <laughs> to interrupt. Can we just do an interpreter switch? 
absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Uh, switching over to Kyra. Okay, Joey. One word to sum up how you feel. Is it going to change? In interestingly, my word is going to be fear. Um, because when lockdown first happened, I, I had this huge sense of fear. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I won't be able to access the mental health support. What am I, I'm going to go crazy in the house. And then in the last few days, I've had that fear come back again. Now that isolation might be coming to an end, I'm, I'm scared of the, uh, I feel like it's going to be such an overwhelming experience. And it's going to be so easy for everyone to just return back to how it used to be. As somebody who didn't have a physical disability and then developed one that's a worsening disability, I have felt both sides of the story from being able-bodied and then having this disability that is slowly paralyzing you. And I know how easy it possibly could be for people to forget and for disabled people, there is a constant battle. I always see in my head hurdles. Every time you knock one down, there's another one, there's another one, and you're always fighting. And it's a really interesting point from Amit, which I really agree with, is that the, the, the population at the moment has had that government support step in the minute lockdown happened. I mean, it may have been a few weeks delay, but it will be nothing like the year's delay that people with disabilities have to wait just to get the simplest bits of support. Yeah. Okay, so fear that we're not going to learn. Fear that it's just going to go back and be worse, but also that we're potentially going to be forgotten again. Jo, a word, uh, how are you feeling? Uh, well, I really agree with Amit that I think it's going to be painful. Um, but I think I feel stubborn. I want to hold on to a feeling of stubbornness because I think, yeah, like other panelists have talked about, suddenly there was this ability to do things. Suddenly, um, these archaic institutions could put their programs online with captioning. Um, still, maybe you had to email to ask for the captioned version. I, so I feel like there is a foot in the door now and we're at the table, but I want to go further and sort of be as stubborn as possible and ask who is sitting in what chair. So now we have access to these, these programs, these organizations, let's look at how we stay there. Okay, fantastic. Rinku, over to you for, for one word that really summarizes what you think the cultural sector um, might be after lockdown? Are you feeling optimistic? Are you pessimistic? What word would you use? Uh, right. Oh gosh, that's really difficult for me to answer. So generally, well, I'm just not sure, but I'm thinking about hearing people. I mean, and I'm sure they'll sort of go back to managing fine, but I'm thinking about the deaf community and I'm thinking when lockdown's lifted, oh, is it going to back, go back to normal for us or do we have a new normal? Will deaf people manage after lockdown? Because I've heard so many rumours of deaf people's mental health crashing and there's now a fear, um, you know, that, um, that, even though COVID's reducing and the numbers are reducing, there's still a fear out there in the community. And, you know, the community just doesn't know what's gonna happen next. So it just feels like a battle for deaf people over their hearts and their minds. Um, you know, they're not sure whether, you know, they should still self isolate. There's a lot of fear there that they're having to deal with and cope with. It's not just me, it's lots of deaf people have had to learn how to cope with this situation. So, are they going to manage when we come out of lockdown? When the restrictions are lifted, are they going to feel all right? Or is the community crashing? That's what I'm worried about. Um, I'm sorry, I know you said something positive. Uh, and I know, you know, I'm kind of thinking about my, the soul of people and people's souls. I think that's going to be a positive thing. I think because 
of who they are and lockdowns make people made people change made them different they haven't been able to stay the same so but i think there's a fear of going back to normal um there's a fear of but what if we don't go back to normal what if things are different okay we've had we've had some questions come up we've had questions i've tried to feed some of them in but just so you can read them out or read them out rather we've had questions about theatre makers better engaging with communities that Jerry and I spoke about. Um, somebody asked Rinku if you could clarify the connection between comparing deaf community and native indigenous people. So that's something that we can uh, look at. We've been asked about the urgent stories that have been um, created and amplified by COVID and what role art can play in helping us tell those stories as well and how we communicate the change, which is part of what we've just been talking about there. So these are all things that we can carry on within the smaller groups um, after, after the break. I know we're heading uh, for a break now. Oh, also uh, programming potentials and artists trying to make their work as widely inclusive as possible. What training might be useful to instill or to enable that inclusivity into their practice, particularly bearing in mind there's different needs for different disabilities. And there's also been um, a comment that uh, the blind community aren't featured within this panel. We need to recognise and use that experience. Although I think Joe defines uh, very much as visually impaired. So within the panel itself, certainly um, very much represented here, actually. Um, so I'm going to pass over to, I think, Isabella or uh, somebody who's going to tell us um, what happens next before we head into our break. But before I do that, can I thank the panel hugely for coming to their computers uh, for the last hour or so um, and answering quite a tough set of questions um, being fired at them. So I don't know what the Zoom equivalent of round of applause is. Um, I think I'm just going to do this in a kind of applausey type way. Deaf hands, waving. 